Okay, so today we're learning Parashat Behar. Behar and Behokotah. We have two Parashiot. Hopefully we'll get through half of one. They'll be okay. But we have one, one of the most amazing concepts in Torah in terms of both the, uh, the practical benefits for the community, for the, for the individual, for the community, for the land. And it is something that, that at the time seemed completely out of whack, like it's completely crazy. What is that? It's Kitavo el Aretz. It's in verse uh, two. Kitavo el Aretz. Asher I notel nachem v'shaveta Aretz Shabbat ladonai. When you enter the land that I assigned to you, the land shall observe a Sabbath of the Lord. Um, then the 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 land has to take a sabbatical. The the land, the, the fields. What what is this? Shesh shanit is rasadecha v'shesh shanit is mokar mecha v'asavtai tevuata. You could sow your field and uh, prune your vineyard for six years. And gather the yield, uh, the crops. But in the seventh year, the land shall have a Sabbath of complete rest. Sabbath of the Lord. You shall not sow your field, nor prune your vineyard, not reap the aftergrowth of your harvest, or gather the grapes of your untrimmed vines. It shall be a year of complete rest for the land. Again, stressing again and again, complete rest for the land. Why the emphasis? Because probably when Moshe said that, people look at him and said, this is a complete, I don't want to say whatever, nonsense, it's impossible, this is not something that's going to work, if the, 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 uh, the motto or the, the, wor- the, uh, the working theory of almost every uh, <coughs> farmer in, in the past, and even today, is take as much as you can from the land, while you can, while you can. may I make a yeah. um, prime example of you don't uh, do what it says in the Torah, Dust Bowl. Yes, exactly. That's what happens yeah. when you don't right. let the Right, land the dust rest. bowl in the Midwest is where the, the, the land <coughs> is drained of all, the, uh, of all the minerals and of all the soil that sort of binds together um, and leaves, leaves the garden place. But, they, but I guess they usually do, I mean, afterwards they usually uh, go around the field. In other words, one section of the thing you never use and you sort of go... Yeah, that's right. But that's, that's another issue. That's P.A. P.A. is the corner of the field. And that's done every year. So in terms of what the gifts that you have to give from your field, there's a whole list. You have to be really, uh, like you say, Tamil Chochem, you know, like to be a scholar to know uh, what, how you, you take care of the field. And then itself, remember we spoke several times about that, that's the whole concept of the Torah, that you, you use it in your daily life. It's not, you don't sit in a, in a Bet Midrash and study, but rather you apply the, the, the laws as you go. Uh, on, in daily life, and a lot of it was in the field. So, how to cultivate the field? How to uh, take care of uh, of the uh, um, of watering and all that? There were laws of damages. Can how how close to my neighbor's field can I can I plow? There, are, this is defined by law. Uh, watering. When I want to I want to dig a pit, a water collection uh, cistern or or, or uh, aqueduct. All these things are governed by law because they have to do with with the damages. Yes, but Helen. Wasn't this good husbandry? Oh. In that he's giving them the land. It's a fruitful land, as it seems when they start. But they shouldn't overdo it because then it too could become right. a, a dust bowl, and mm-hmm. nothing will grow there anyway. Right now. It seems um, it's like tzedaka for the land, but more prominently. Right. It's tzedaka for the land, but it helps people in, on multiple levels that they cannot even imagine. Uh, but we'll see one, two more psukim. One second, is, uh, is on verse 6 and 7. It says, Ve'ayta Shabbat haaretz lachem le'ochla. And then, whatever comes out from the land during that Sabbath, you, your male and female slaves, the hired and bound laborers will live with you and your cattle and the beasts in your land may eat all its yield. It's very similar to the language that we have on Shabbat. Shabbat, it says, Leman, Yanuah, Avdecha, Vamatecha, Shocha, Vahamorecha, like everyone has to rest. That's, that's a, 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 like the grand equalizer. Shabbat is the great equalizer. Everybody's on the same level, everybody rests. Whereas in the ancient world, either you were a working man and, or a slave and you worked, 24 7, or you were a free man and you had other people working for you. You never took a break. And even if you were a free man and you didn't have laborers, you had to work around the clock. 
You only stop when you collapse. That, that's that's the uh, uh, or when or based on the agrarian seasons, you would work all summer, all spring, all summer, and then in the winter after you gather the crops, you bring everything home and you rest. But even then, it's not complete rest because then you have to pickle and preserve and 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 cut and and grind. So people worked around the clock. To come and say one day you take off and it's for everyone was a revolution. And to say one year you take off is a revolution, but it has many benefits. <laughs> well, yes, as What is quite remarkable about this, but I have any comments on it. They're being given this law, but it's 40 years before they're going to get that. Right. They don't know yet that it's going to take 40 years. <laughs> but, well, right now they're, but, they're on the verge of getting into it. Yeah, but, uh, but God knew. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Even after they're being punished. I mean, what you're saying is going to happen later in the book of Amidbar, but even if they're being punished in Parashat B'Shalah, and they're told, you're not going to enter the land now, Arba'im Shana, for 40 years, you're going to travel. The, the next law that they get is, when you come into the land, that's what you should do. As, as, as if, which, which is, uh, it's not, it's not it's like... It's very strange. Yes. I think in a, in a way, it's like saying, there's hope. Don't give up. Even so though they haven't been punished yet. Yes. <laughs> Here, they, they don't even know about that yet. Uh, Scribe to write down these laws as they're no, given this, from wherever it comes so that they have it for the future? As, as or it do is, they right. just take it as it is because it's so long in the future? It seems, no, they, they, they memorize it. I mean, it's Moshe right, wrote yes. Moshe wrote the scrolls, according to our tradition, and people memorized it. And then when they came into the land, they they kept this for a very short while, and then they forgot everything because of that. They weren't comfortable with it. Now, but what are the benefits of this of this system? There are several benefits. Like one, like what Don mentioned, he said today, you know, the agricultural system is to only till or only work parts of the land, and the rest you follow. The because it's really difficult to do it on a on a national level. You need you need to have a certain degree of uh, of faith. And also total collaboration from the whole nation, oh, yeah. because if I will do that and you will not do that, then you are going to get greater crops and you're going to sell them. You're going to get more money. Mm-hmm. So it's 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 really. I just heard now they were talking in, in uh, uh, on the radio about India's move from cash to credit card. Six months ago, Modi, the uh, the, the 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 prime minister declared that there's no more, you can't use cash in transactions. But the whole country moved from 90% of the people using cash to using ATM. But it really depended on no alternative. Because once you have an alternative, some people will do it, some people will not do it. In the time of the Torah, if you follow biblical law, there's no alternative. During the seventh year, you do nothing. Now, what happens as a result? First of all, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, Ben, about... Uh, compost and putting, you know, back uh, banana peels and stuff into the land. They didn't need to do that because the crops would stay in the field. You would harvest the the uh, the crops, and then since you're not plowing, you allow for slow deterioration of whatever is left in the field. Things will grow in the next year. It's called an Hebrew safia. That's the so the fallout of the grains that you will have some crops. And even on the third year, it's the the eighth year. The, the one year after you fallow the land, you will still have growths called sahish. It's mentioned in Ishayahu that is like the, you know, the 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 grandson of, of that of that uh, uh, yeah, really. grain that you sowed yourself. So you still have fruits coming out of the land. You you're allowed to harvest whatever grows and store it, but it has to be open storage, meaning anyone can take from it. So now. First of all, and this is something that only uh, people started understanding in the 50s, in the 1950s, uh, it allows you to restore uh, trace minerals to the land without using chemical fertilizers, without using uh, nitrogen uh, uh, and phosphorus and all that, which are unhealthy because eventually they seep into our water system. Instead, you get all these minerals are recovered by the land. (coughs) One year of not of fouling the land, the land recovers those minerals. It's an amazing uh, benefit. 
The other thing is that just like the Shabbat is an equalizer, where everybody is, is equal, you know, everybody uh, rests on Shabbat, the, uh, the Shemitah is an equalizer in the sense of no one owns a field sort of right now. You could walk into my field and take whatever you want. And the, uh, until today, one of the greatest uh, assets that people consider to be an asset is a land. That's why it's called real estate. Like the rest is unreal, unreal estate, right? In Hebrew, it's called uh, in Sp- it's, it's the same as in Spanish, immobiliaria, something that doesn't move. You go like, okay, someone could steal your iPhone, but it's very difficult to steal your land. Uh, I mean, they have this, people do that, right? Fixed, those are fixed. <laughs> those are fixed assets, right? But now he says, I am opening my fixed asset, my field, to everyone. You could come in and just take, take the fruit, take the food. It's an equalizer. Now, there's a third benefit here, and that is part of the, the grand scheme, the grand system of the Torah, which is the idea of that giving is receiving. And the more you give, the more you receive. Now, the, 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 there's, a, there's a catch here. The catch here that you want to give not for the sake of receiving, but for the sake of giving. Uh, I mentioned several times the, the book by a professor in uh, UPenn, Adam Grant, called Give and Take, where he studied the uh, the uh, givers and takers in society. Where do they rank in terms of the uh, social hierarchy? And he found out, first of all, he divides society into three into three categories: givers. Takers and matchers. So the, ta- the, the takers are mm-hmm. selfish. The, the takers just mm-hmm. take whatever they can from people, drain their resources, and then move on to the next. And usually they cause disaster. Givers give unconditionally. Uh, and matchers are sort of like uh, they would make connections. They benefit from it. They Right. Now, what he, what he found was that at the top of the social ladder, you find the givers. But you also find them at the bottom of the social ladder. Meaning, when you look at school, who is the most successful student? The top are the givers, and the bottom are givers. Uh, and, and, and takers hover sometimes, like in the upper threads, but they're not on top. And then he, he studied even further to try to figure out what is happening there. And he found that there are two types of givers. Some people give, as I said, un- unconditionally. Some people limit their giving. When do they limit their giving? So if you give unconditionally, you run the risk of being stepped all over, and because there will be takers who will come and uh, and, and take advantage of you. But the the the, the smart giver is uh, would only give to people who keep giving, not back to him. It's not about it's not selfish. It's not about me. But at a certain point, you realize, I give to that person, but that's where the buck ends. It really stops. It doesn't move on. It could be, for example, even in terms of teaching. Let's say you have a good recipe, and you share your recipes with everyone. And then, but you realize one of your friends whom you share your recipe with would not share it with anyone else, or would not share her recipes with anyone else. So you say, okay, so why am I sharing with you? Same with money, same with knowledge, anything that you, you have. Uh, now, but on the other hand, why givers succeed is because giving is an engine of growth. It's subconscious, but it's an engine of growth because when you're willing to give to others, you always have an incentive to move on. People undergo crisis in life. They have difficulties, they have downfalls, financial crisis, whatever it is. But if they're driven by the will to give to others, they will always be able to pull themselves up and continue because they have something that's greater than them. And it could be family, it could be, uh, could be uh, activism, it could be volunteering, it could be charity. And it always... Now, what the Torah does, it gears our, our mind towards giving by saying, you have to give 10% of your crops to the Levite, and 10% to the poor. And on the seventh year, you have to do this. And you have to live, like you said before, Don, a corner of the field, and everything that falls behind. So now you say, wait a second. If I, I need for my house a hundred pounds of wheat a year, but that's not going to be enough because I'm going to set to to give tithe. So I need hundred and twenty. 
So let's make 120. You do 120 pounds and you give 20 pounds to all the different charities. And then you say, wow, like what happens at the end of the year? You do, we do like what the Hezbollah Nefesh or calculations say. Okay, we've consumed 100 pounds of grain. How did it change my mental or spiritual status? Nothing. I'm just alive. Right? If I wouldn't have, we wouldn't have this food, we wouldn't be alive. Okay, so we survived. That's good. Whatever, whatever we did for ourselves was for survival. But we gave 20 pounds of, of wheat to the poor. That's amazing. That, that you'll keep in mind for years. I gave food to the poor. Right? Nobody can take it away from you. Even though for the poor it's the same experience. He ate it and that's it. It's gone. Right? But you don't know that it's gone. You don't think about the gone part of it. You think about the giving part of it. And it's, it's a... Um, I mentioned that also an experiment was done with happiness, trying to figure out what makes people happier. And they found out that when people were given money and they were told, use this money to buy a coffee for yourself or to buy a coffee for someone else. And also rate your happiness in the morning and in the evening. The people who bought some coffee for someone else were happier in the evening. Why? I did a good thing. So the good deed always stays with you, even though the cup of coffee, whether it was for you or for another person, is long, you know, crumbled in, the, in some garbage, uh, garbage uh, can. Yes? Did you see that film, Paying It Forward? No. I ne- yeah. The principle yeah. yes. is that because we're all so busy being rude to other looking people because right. we're looking after ourselves right. and etc. Yes. And the first person who starts that off Yes. By saying to an old lady like me, crossing the street, <laughs> the bags are too heavy for you, I'll carry them. Yes. Now, she might not be able to do the same thing for something else, but she'll show it to somebody right. else in a different way. Mm. And Allah die, we would all be helpful to each other. Right. And peaceful and loving. Mm-hmm. My dreams, I wish. <laughs> and um, it, it, it's a lovely idea. It is, a, right. So the Torah ideally encourages people to do that. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, with, you know, with time, people like think, you know, from you didn't help from you didn't, you know, and, uh, and we help other Jews and we have to be able to open up to help, to help everyone. And in a, in, a, in a way, you know, a lot of Jews who are activists and help charity and global charities all over the world are doing that unknowingly because they have these kind of biblical values. Um, but the, the amazing thing is that if someone, you know, you get a kick out of giving and then you say, I want to give more, so let me work a little more to do that. So I know that a hundred pounds is enough for my household, but next year I want to do 200 pounds to, so I can give more. So you end up, and if this is something that makes you happy and you're in a good place, you were this positive energy, you could do even more, and you could influence other people. So this is, I think, one of the one of the uh, the the secrets of the Torah and an engine of growth within the Torah is this one. Yes. Then there's another thing that I, I it took me a while personally to understand, you know, with experience and reading about creativity and all that, and that's the hidden element within all that, which is that the Torah forces people to step out of their comfort zone. Even if only conceptually. I mean, we don't know for how long they did that. But the Torah, and even Shabbat does that. Shabbat forces you to stop in a way. On one hand, it tells you to rest. On the other hand, it tells you stop doing what you're doing. Now, what happens is that we do whatever work we do. Wouldn't Purim be a good example? What? Purim? Yeah. Because Purim, yeah, but yeah, right. <laughs> Purim came so much later. But yeah, it is. It's still good. You... You sort of like allow yourself to be a little crazy and it's good because you explore things maybe in your personality that you don't know. But on a regular basis, Shabbat, and then the seventh year. What happens in the seventh year? Like I said, your, your regular schedule as a farmer is get up in the morning, go to the field, milk the cows, so, you know, plow. So, I mean, you still have to milk the cows. But you don't, you don't have to do all the other things that are related to the field. And then, after you bring all the, the crops home, you have to, to pickle and preserve and bake and grind and whatever. Now, the Torah says, that's it, no, no more work in the field. So, okay, what do you do? You have now uh, 50% of your, the, the time that was occupied before is now freed 
What are you going to do with that? Well, so either you're going to, I mean, there were no TV, there was no TV or, or, or internet at the time. Today people probably would sit with their iPhone, uh, probably in the field, on the tractor with the, with the iPhone. Um, by the way, there's a, in, in some of the malls, I, it's something I, I spoke about in the speech like 10 years ago as a joke. I said that there are strollers for kids, you know, baby strollers, or, or, or prams, how do you call them in? Uh, prams. Prams in England, uh, with uh, electric windows and, and phones. And, and one of the ladies came to say, where can they get them? And that was 10 years ago. <laughs> now I saw in the mall in, uh, in Wheaton, in Wheaton Mall, there are carts, you know, like you, you take, like, yeah. uh, take a cart yeah. for a kid, where you can send the kid. There's an iPad in each cart. Yeah. That's it, sure. you know? Sure you know, get, keep your child busy because God forbid you're going to talk to him like we used to do when you go to the market and say, look, that's an orange. You want to feel it? Feel the orange. No, swipe the orange. That's uh, on the screen. By the way, I go back to that. Uh, what happens when you have free time at that time? Maybe you're going to go look around the house and see if you can do some maintenance. But maybe you're going to sit and write a poem or a book or... or, or uh, or start cooking, I don't know, or make uh, liquors. Uh. <laughs> you're, you're describing yeah. an idealistic society yes. which really never, never existed. Exists. Right, right. It never existed. Right. I but, mean, the concept is nice, and uh, so much of in the Torah is conceptual. Right, I agree. But it, it's never lived that Right, way. already here, the, 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 the Torah says... I know that you're not going to keep it. So that, and when you don't keep it, I'm going to kick you out of the land. <laughs> so the land will rest for the, 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 the time that it didn't rest when you were there. One second. But, but the thing is, even if this we didn't keep, but Shabbat we did. And Shabbat has the same benefit. Yeah. Because it, it creates this type of mental switch. Shabbat you can manage. It's one day a week. But not everybody can manage year, Shabbat. One year in seven. Right. That's, a, that's, that's insane. Diff- right. Does that mean... It's not real. It's, it's not real, right. But people did it for a while, and some people do it in Israel now. But I think that the, the, even the idea that you could take off and the world is not going to come to an end, I think that, that Jews, wherever they went, <coughs> realized that, that you, uh, maybe that's the idea that they got from here. You should not rely on one thing only. And, to, one second, and, and, and there is a term for that in agriculture, and it spreads all over, and it's uh, monoculture. Monoculture is when you grow only one thing, yes. right? If you only grow corn in the fields, right? Everybody says, oh, corn is great, so we, all, we are all going to grow corn. It, it is disastrous. Because you're you're missing cross pollination, right? And then within the monoculture, you choose one brand of corn, which is the best, or the the, the acute problem today, bananas. You choose one brand of bananas. The Chiquita bananas are the best bananas. They sturdy that you you don't grow any other bananas. Then when there's a bacteria or a virus or a bug, like blood, that's it. It's all gone. The same <coughs> problem of monoculture is culturalism. Can ever everything. If you only learn one thing, if you only do one type of work, then uh, we frown upon jack of all trades. But it's good to be jack of all trades as long as you have one trade which is your center. But you know how to do other things. Then you're creative. And you think think really about Jewish culture in in history. It was always creative, always looking for different things, always adjusting, never locked down. Okay, this is what we do. Yeah. When people did lock themselves down, <coughs> it was disastrous. Like Jews in certain parts of Germany became uh, vintners. And they had vineyards and they made wine. And every time there was a pogrom or, or a persecution or crusade, they ran away and then they were brought back, we need you to make wine for us. Mm-hmm. Right? And they should have realized, okay, you know, this is... When, when we stuck with one thing, we lost it. When... Uh, uh, when, 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 you, when you diversify, just like diversifying your investment is good in, in monetary uh, terms, it's also good in the field of what do you do for a living. So I think this, these are the, some of the benefits that you have with the Shemitah. Uh, like for, yeah, let me, let me, let's stop here. There are much more to discuss.